Hey, what's happening, everybody? I'm Larry Roberts, and this is another episode of the Readily Random Podcast. Hey, you could be larger than life, bigger than the world. Uh, it's nothing new. We've all experienced it, I believe, at some point in our lives. And I, I think it'll be interesting to hear this take on it because maybe we might have a little uh, little difference in, in our viewpoints and maybe uh, I can learn a lot. Not maybe, I'll definitely learn a lot. But anyhow, um, I should have asked before we started the show, but I'm just going to say, Barbara Coloroso, did I get that right? You absolutely did. Bingo, I love it. Well, Barbara, if you would, yeah. please take a minute or two, tell us about yourself, your background, and uh, what got you into writing about such a volatile topic? Uh, well, I'm Barb Coloroso. I've been uh, lecturing throughout the world for the last 47 years on topics like parenting, uh, uh, discipline, creating positive school climate, uh, parenting through crisis, including school shootings and death, murder, suicide and illness and mayhem in the community. And after I finished that book, I was flying it to my publisher and uh he said, people from all over the world know you're from Littleton, where we had the school shooting. And would you write an epilogue in the book about it? And I said, um, I'll write an epilogue about mayhem in communities, but not just specifically about the shootings at Columbine, because we were unique. Every school shooting is, but we weren't special. And before I finished that, there had been 10 other um, shootings. And so we are not unique. I mean, we are not special. We are unique. So he said to me, well, would you write a book on bullying? I said, no, I don't like to write. Uh, I really don't. I prefer to speak. Um, when you write, they make you finish sentences and they tell you what not to end a sentence with. Uh, <laughs> only English majors will get that one. I said, nope, nope, not going to do it. He asked me a third time. I said, yes. But in between the second and third, our youngest, who was 24 at that point, a successful graphic illustrator said, mom, maybe if you write it, other kids won't go through what I went through in grade school. Our son was targeted kindergarten through grade four. We, both educators, handled it poorly, and the school handled it worse. Um, and so I committed to writing it. Um, and often people, when they hear I'm from Littleton, they'll say, well, is it because of the shootings at Columbine? No, uh, not at all. And I had been lecturing before on the difference between normal, natural, and necessary conflict, which all kids need to experience, uh, and the concept of bullying, which is about mean and cruel, which nobody should have to go through. Big difference. And uh, I also talk about three characters, the bully, the bullied, and the not-so-innocent bystanders. Yes. William Burroughs said it so beautifully, there are no innocent bystanders. What were they doing there in the first place? Um, and I talk about that in the book, the different roles kids can play. But my goal in all of my work from parenting to education to the juvenile justice system is to raise a fourth character, that brave hearted kid, that witness, resistor and defender who, when the high status social bully says to all the other grade eight girls, I don't like the new girl. You want to be in my group? Don't eat lunch with her. I want your daughter to be the one to say, that's mean, that's cruel and have the courage. And believe me, it takes courage to go sit next to the new girl. She's not going to get, get scratch and sip stickers and stars or lunch with the principal. What she'll probably get is, oh, Miss Goody Two-Shoes or you're next. And I want your boy, when his friends say, oh, look at that kid over there, different skin color, religion, gender, physical or mental ability, the big five for hate crimes. What makes a hate crime different than any other crime? It's criminal bullying. Let's go mess him up. I want your son to be the one to say no. When the burden's heavy, when his friends say, what are you, chicken? What do you just like them? No. So my goal in all of my work is what can we do in home, school, and community to raise that fourth character who is willing to stand up and speak out for someone else? Well, you know, I think you, you just said something that kind of triggered with me. My, my brother in sixth grade, and this was a while back, because <laughs> I think <laughs> I was a freshman in high school, so we'll call it 86. We'll say it was uh, 86, and uh, he was in sixth grade, stepped off the bus. He was going to public school. I, for a completely different reason, was going to a private school. But he stepped off the bus. Another kid stepped off the bus, a few kids behind him, and shot himself. Gone, right there. And this was in 86. And uh, from that point forward, my brother got yanked out of public school or community, as you had mentioned, and went straight into homeschooling. My mom homeschooled him from yeah. that point forward. 
And I noticed it was a horrible it, thing for him to have to witness. Oh, most definitely. You know, and I think there was some, I don't think, I know there was some residual effects from there that. Are. There you know, are. My brother isn't quite as social by any means as I am, but that definitely uh, compounded his resistance to social interaction. So they put him in private school, and in my personal opinion, socially, he just took a nosedive. So I found it interesting that you said that you said homeschooling or homeschooled or community schooled individuals. How do we train up that fourth person? So uh, there's got to be some contrast there, uh, significant contrast, I would assume. Uh, could you expand on that a bit? Because I actually have an episode of home, about homeschooling. I had a homeschool mom come yeah. on, so I think it'd be interesting. Yeah, and I've often I have done homeschool community conferences, um, and. Uh, we really have to look at the whole child and look at and, and there's such a variety today of of public schools, private schools, international schools, uh, baccalaureate schools, uh, religious schools. Uh, and homeschooling has really changed in terms of kids being integrated for part times into various programs and the like. So what I look at is we don't want to make praise dependent, reward dependent kids. We want kids to know how to think, not just what to think. To be willing um, to recognize skepticism and wonder. All three-year-olds have it. Uh, you know, the why and the wow. Wow, look at the spaghetti. Wow, look at the sky. Wow, look at the snake. Wow, wow, wow. And why, 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 why? Well, I want your 16-year-olds, regardless of how they were educated, to have that gift of, of wonder. They tend not to harm themselves and others when they do. And the gift of skepticism. When that kid says, let's mess that kid up. Or let's go vandalize the building. I want your kids. And why would I do that? But so much culturally helps kids become what I call the bullies, minions or henchmen. Sure. Where they will do the bullies bidding. They're not bullies themselves. But they're willing to go put their backpack down because the high status social bully said to. So the new girl can't sit there. And they do it. And they say, but I didn't bully her. No, but you're part of the problem. If you put that backpack down. Um, and I want them to understand that uh, praise dependent, reward dependent kids who are not making their own decisions uh, are more likely to be that henchman or minion. Uh, so I start very young with kids. Uh, I say, I don't say to them, you want to go to bed or not? That's not a, a thing I'm going to ask a two-year-old. Right. But I do say, do you want to go to bed now with your red pajamas or now with your blue pajamas? And lo and behold, a kid shows up, red bottoms, blue top. <laughs> I've always said if it's <clears throat> if it's not life threatening, morally threatening or unhealthy, let it go. Let him experience the consequences. And basically, red pajama on top, blue on bottom. So what? Right. Then you age appropriate and ability appropriate. You give kids responsibilities and decision making in all areas of their lives. But in the clothing, I would say you go from red pajama, blue pajama to three outfits, pick one in preschool. And then they get to grade school. You say, here's your school clothes. Here's your play clothes. Pick something from your school clothes. And regularly, our middle daughter would show up with the layered look. All school clothes, just definitely layered. Now, I know a lot of parents who would say, go pick out an outfit and stand there and say, you can't wear that one. Um, it's not life-threatening to wear the layered. Look, it's painful to parent, but it's not life-threatening to the kid. <laughs> you let it go. Um, my oldest, who is 43, has been picking since she was two. I'm assuming when she goes to work, she picks out her own clothes. You know, but middle school, watch what we tend to do. We tend to start over. Here's three outfits, pick one. Yep. I can't tell you how many middle school parents have come up to me and said, would you look at this kid? He was such a good kid. He was so well-behaved, so well-mannered. Now look at him. And I look at the kid. I get to know the parents. I say, you know what? He hasn't changed. They go, what? Say, hasn't changed. From the time he was little, he dressed the way you told him to dress, acted the way you told him to act, said the things you told him to say. He's been listening to somebody else tell him what to do. He's been doing it. He hasn't changed. He's still listening to somebody else tell him what to do problem is, isn't you anymore. It's his peers. Right. And so it's critical, no matter what environment our children are getting their education in, that they learn how to think, not just what to think. And we give them the opportunity to make choices, decisions, and mistakes, hold them accountable, 
and allow them to experience consequences for the choices they did make. Again, unless it's life-threatening, morally threatening, or unhealthy. You don't say to a 16-year-old, go ahead and jump off the building. We'll discuss the consequences after you land. No, you pull them back, give them a second chance at life. But the rest of the time, I like to give kids that opportunity. No, I think that's great. You know, I got to be honest, I was a little um, apprehensive regarding our conversation because, you know, me being, uh, I think I'm a tough guy. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I was a 20 some odd year martial artist and, you know, used You'd to be tough with a big uh, heart. Ex- well, that. that is so funny because no matter what, even then with some of the examples you gave and I, I don't know, I don't know that my parents really contributed to it. I'm sure they did to a certain degree, or maybe I just didn't want to be like them, but I would see something. It could be both. <laughs> yeah, it, it, right. Because they had a very uh, tumultuous relationship and it was chaos in the house quite a bit. And I knew I didn't want that going forward. Right. So I had developed a, a, a state of empathy and not only was I empathetic, but I was, I was bullied a lot. I was bullied by my stepdad. I was bullied by my real parental fa- – not parental, but uh, uh, my biological, biological father. There you go. Thank you. My biological father. Um, I was born with a birth defect. I had mentioned earlier with the, uh, the private school. I was born with a birth defect, and at four, four and a half, I had surgery that was corrective. I was born with an inverted sternum. So my sternum was growing in, my lungs and all my organs were growing out. It crushed, yeah. And yeah, so we had to do something to fix that or I wasn't going to see five is really what it amounted to. So we did that, but the surgery was very, very, I mean, it was very invasive. They broke ribs and I mean, it was crazy. Painful? Yes, I'm sure it was. I don't have a whole lot of memory of the pain, which I'm glad for, but uh, I knew, well, they're telling me, my parents told me at the time that they put me in private school because it was afraid of contact. And they wanted to put me someplace where I could be sheltered, I could be babied, I could be nurtured, and let my 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 structure heal, you know, like, heal. like it yeah. needed to. So they did that, and from that point forward, really, other than a couple of adventures to public school, trying to be the real tough guy uh, that failed miserably, uh, <laughs> I was in private school my whole life. But uh, the two times that I did try public school, oh my gosh, you want to talk about getting bullied? It was unreal, and it was bullying. Is it because you look different, or you were new? I mean, you'd be targeted because you're new. I don't know. You know? If it, well, and different ages, it's you're more at risk. In eighth grade, it ha- I have to attribute it to being new because I didn't, yeah. I didn't go out of my way to change much about how I acted, whether it was at my private school or public. Now I went in there fearful. And I may have been putting off a, an air of fear, which is, you know, victimizing in and of itself. Yeah. Uh, because I'd heard all these stories, you know, oh, if you go to public school, you'll never last. Oh, you'll And this school is the worst. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, I did that and got into a few altercations and whatnot. And I just decided it wasn't for me it, it, because, I mean, it was just too hard. I just wanted to go to school and have a good time. So I ran back to my private school. And then in high school, I tried it again my sophomore year. And went in this time with attitude. You know, I, I, I didn't care. I, I mean, I cared about my school, but I didn't care if anybody stepped to me. I was going to knock them down, right? Well, that doesn't work when there's three on one. <laughs> well, aggression never be, it only gets more aggression. Passivity invites it. You don't want to be passive. But it's, assertion can dissipate it. And that's one of the things I talk with about kids who are at high risk. I'm a special ed teacher. My degrees are in LD, ED, and MR. And I used to say, you know, there are kids who are more at risk, especially if they've had any um, disability of any kind, or they look different, or they have an allergy. Uh, weight-based bullying is is here. Um, any of those things. But you can be targeted because you're short, tall, developed early, developed late, race, religion, gender, physical or mental ability, economic status. You can be targeted because you're new. Exactly. The one thing all targeted kids have in common, somebody targeted them. And that's where I want to go. Notice I use the word target. Gavin DeBecker, who wrote Gift of Fear, used that word. He said, you're not a victim. You have been targeted. The problem is with them. The bullies and all their henchmen who are doing the bidding or watching or laughing. You see, bullies about getting pleasure from somebody else's pain. Right. Uh, And it's, uh, you know, when you're in a conflict, you're both angry. You're both upset. And we often say, uh, if it's three on one, believe me, you didn't have a fight with somebody. They attacked you. And we have to make sure we get the language right, that um, you were attacked and you fought back. That's a world of difference. Like I said at the very beginning, the difference between normal, natural, and necessary conflict, 
fairly equally balanced and you're learning how to get along with people. And my job is to teach you how to do it nonviolently as an educator or a parent, because violence is not going to work. Um, but we, when it comes to bullying, I want the language uh, ter- properly. Um, ooh, I hit that. There we go. I, lost I you, want it to be proper. Um, that if you have a three on one, that is not a conflict. That is an attack. And right. we need to treat it that way um, as an attack. And um, it's interesting. You said something else about the pain of your surgeries have dissipated the actual pain. There's a man who wrote the ethics of memory. And he talked about people who had been tortured. And it's the memory of the injury versus the memory of the insult. And you didn't get the insult. You didn't get mocked for your scars, I hope. But when a kid, you know, you know, you often hear kids say, I wish they'd have just hit me and it'd be over. Right. Because right. when he studied people who had been tortured and did functional MRIs on them, he found that the pain of the injury dissipates. The pain of the injury, um, which the insult, the verbal insult, the re- shunning of other uh, by other kids, never goes away. Oh, and I can it confirm that. Um, and so people will say, but physical bullying is the worst. No, you ask kids being socially isolated from your peers and the verbal taunting. Verbal bullying is the most common. Boys and girls do that one equally well. And we as educators and parents have to get on kids' cases when they dehumanize another human being with verbal taunts, even when they're little. And people will say, well, he doesn't really know what he means, but he knows. He's got a smile on his face. He knows what I said was mean and cruel to that little boy or girl. Um, And the verbal bullying... Uh, is the most common. Boys and girls, again, do that equally well. Sure. Physical bullying is the least amount done. And I'll guarantee you, if you have a child who's been physically bullied, he or she has been verbally and or socially bullied first. See, and I think Rarely that's something... Rarely do kids resort to the physical first. Now, very few boys resort to it. They fight a lot and they threaten it, but that's verbal bullying. Sure. Um, very small number of girls do, although that's on the rise today, but they don't need to. They have in their social arsenal something far more powerful, Shun- is social or relational bullying, shunning, rumor, gossip, and exclusion. And with the online and offline worlds merging today, for boys and girls, that can be the most devastating kind of bullying. And it's often paired with the verbal. So you have the shunning, you're locking them out of chat rooms. We don't want to eat with you. We don't like you uh, kind of thing. And the verbal. Uh, dehumanization. I work in Rwanda with orphans from the 94 genocide, where in 100 days, a million human beings were macheted to death. The premise of my extraordinary evil book is that it's a short walk from hateful rhetoric to hate crimes to crimes against humanity. It's no giant leap. They didn't kill Tutsis. They killed cockroaches. Jews weren't killed in Nazi Germany. The Nazis called them vermin and bacteria. See, so in their minds, they were killing vermin. These were human beings, Jews and Roma and Sinti. Armenians were dogs. Cambodians were worms. The Rohingya right now in Myanmar are called fleas. Um, And you see, that's why we have to be careful when little kids and older kids dehumanize another human being. And we ourselves as adults, are we seeing this in our culture today, where someone is dehumanized? Um, and once we do that, we can do anything to them and not feel shame or compassion. So uh, that's why I want to stop it right there. Sure. Yeah. And it's, it's hard to do that. You know, and it's funny because I, I, it's not funny, but it's ironic that especially when I was younger, verbal bullying wasn't given any weight whatsoever. I know. It, it was we also- now know that that's wrong. Right. And although this was a physical uh, occurrence on my part, you know, I, eighth grade, my first foray into public school, a kid took my shoe while we were changing out for PE, and he threw it over this fence to like the uh, to like the boiler. You know, it was in the dressing yeah. room, so you had to climb over this fence and to get to and my shoe. I love seeing you humiliated by that. Uh, oh yeah, and he, uh, he topped it off by when I got to the other side and I got my shoe. 
he spit on me through the fence. Yeah. And I, you know, I just, I broke. As an educator, I would have come unglued. I broke. That kid, no more, not here, never. This is mean and cruel. This is safe harbor for every kid. And you got a job to do, buddy. Yeah. And I use restorative practices with them. You uh, you have to own and fix what you did. And they'll say, but how did I do that? Well, you come up with some way. I want you to understand, kid, that what you just did is real hard to repair. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's I'm still carrying hard. it today. I'm Res- 45. Res- <laughs> yeah, resolution. <laughs> I want you to tell me how you're going to keep it from happening again. And don't you dare tell me I won't do it again. What I want you to tell me is what you're going to do instead. This is where our wisdom comes in, where we can help them. And then the third is... When you feel ready, if you ever do, is to allow him to sit down and heal with you. Now, if he sits down and he says, you know, I'm really, I don't even ask for an I'm sorry. But if it comes, it comes. I'm sorry I did that to you. Um, I, I threw your shoe over and I spit on you. I want the kid to own what he did. Then I want you to tell me what you're going to do to keep it from happening again. Oh, I'll call him by his given name. I'll make sure my buddies don't throw his shoes over. I'll invite him to to join our chat room. And then I want you to find a way to heal with him. And he says, you know, I'd love to have you join us at the lunch table. We've ostracized you. I'd like you to join. And you might say, gee, I'd like to do that. But you might not. You might say, you know what? As Steve Seskin said in that beautiful song, Don't Laugh at Me. He said, I'm not asking you to be my friend, but is it too much to ask? Don't laugh at me. Don't call me names. Don't take your pleasure from my pain. I want to know I'm walking PE class and not have my shoes thrown over the way. I want to know that I'm not going to get spit on. I want to know I'm going to walk down the hallway and not see my name written with a gross term. See, that's what I need. What I do in, in a restorative practice is there is I humble the bully, not humiliate, but humble them and empower you. And that takes that dynamic because in bullying, always there is an imbalance of power. It can be size, number, gender, status, position. It can be any of those things. But I want to level the playing field here and empower you to know that it's their problem, not yours. Right. And that what they did was wrong. It's not a conflict. It was about being mean and cruel and getting pleasure from somebody else's pain. Now, let's turn that around, though. And say that he sits down with you and he says, well, I called you a name. I threw the thing over and he's got a smirk on his face. You know what I do right then? We're done. We're done. You're not ready. But mom said I can't have my computer back till I go through this last step. Well, you're not ready. You still got a smirk on your face. You don't have a sense of empathy for the kid you did it to. Nope. And if anybody has to change PE class, it's going to be him. Right. You. Right. I mean, I, I, again, I, you know, I didn't do anything. I didn't even know the kid's name. <laughs> oh, we, we keep looking for what did the target do? You can take a child who's weird, dorky, odd, strange, ADHD, Asperger's, misses social cues. Nothing justifies mean nothing. Right. Do I work on those issues with those kids? Absolutely. But nothing justifies a kid throwing your shoe over and then spitting on you. After you got you've gone over this fence to get your clothes, I think this there's is, no excuse for that. That's just plain mean and cruel. Oh, uh, I hear. Well, boys will be boys. Girls just want to be mean. Not true. They may want to be, and boys can be. But when are we going to say no to this? Right. I'm not asking people to. Um, you know, they say, well, you're not being very strong. Boys need to be able boys need to tumble. I've got two grandsons who are boys. I raised the boy. They're different than girls. And each one of them are different themselves. And we need rough and tumble um, with them. And we have to honor the way they learn and the like. But beating somebody up with a smile on your face, you actually, there's an old song. This will date me. I'm 70, so it's out in the open (laughs) here. I'm old. (laughs) Uh, This is gray hair. Um, There's a song from South Pacific. You have to be carefully taught to hate before you're six, seven, or eight to hate the people your relatives hate. Bullying is a learned behavior. You have to be taught. So I ask adults, how do you treat hired help? How do you treat somebody moving through the grocery store a little slower than you'd like them? How do you treat that new neighbor who's a different skin color, has a different language as their first language, dresses differently than you do, um, cooks different kinds of foods? Your children are watching. And then I also ask you, how do you deal with your bigoted relative at the family gathering? 
Now, we all have bigoted relatives. Some are on that family tree. Some aren't on the branches yet. They're right there at the dinner table spewing bigoted comments thinly disguised as jokes. And they'll say, laugh out loud, just joking. Can your children hear you say, I'm bothered by that, or that was racist, or that was sexist, or that was mean? When all the other relatives roll their eyes, say, what, can't you take a joke? Not that kind. And you know you've had an impact when you walk back in the dining room and everybody shuts up. But you've also had a bigger impact on your children when your mom says, look, it's Uncle George. He's old. Old is never an excuse for bigotry and intolerance, ever. There is no excuse for it. Can your children hear you saying, Mom, I don't ever want my children to believe that that kind of comment is good coming out of anybody's mouth? Now, if you do that, the chances of your daughter standing up for that girl in the lunchroom or your son standing up for that boy in the locker room has greatly increased because they have seen you in a family gathering put it out there. We need to walk our talk and talk our walk with our young people. And if they make a mistake, if they went in with the group, it's called a trap. Sebastian Hafner in Defying Hitler called it a trap of comradeship. When you get a group of people with a powerful leader and you have a henchman, an active supporter, a passive supporter, we also have our disengaged onlookers who turn a blind eye and say, that's just the way they are. Or it's not my problem, not my problem. I don't know that kid. And then on the upswing of the the bully circle, you have uh, the potential witness, the kid you did raise to act with integrity and civility and compassion. But she's afraid of the bully. She's afraid if she steps in, she'll be next. She's afraid if she steps in, she'll make it worse for the target, or she's simply afraid. But at the very top is the antithesis of the bully. And that's that brave-hearted kid who's a witness, goes and reports it to somebody. Resistor says to the bully, you know, back off, leave him alone. You know, hey, we're buddies. You don't have to do that. Or defender who sits down with that new girl or steps in between the bullies and the kid who's targeted um, and is willing to take the consequences. Right. We saw some very brave-hearted human beings, young people and older people, take a bullet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for other people. And it does cost. And we saw in Oregon, three young men stand up when a young girl was being targeted on the bus by a white supremacist. Mm -hmm. And they two died. And the one has a slash all the way down his neck from being cut. Now, the interesting thing about him is he said, I wish all of us would have been willing to do that. He said, I do it again. He has autism. And had been mocked himself. Sure, and he said sure. part of the reason he's standing up is because some people stood up for him. So, you know, we want kids to understand that uh, there are shoulders you stand on, pretty big shoulders you stand on. When you're willing in that lunchroom to go sit next to the new girl, you're willing in the locker room to tell kids to back off. When you report it, when little ones or older ones have a safe way to tell an adult, um, then uh, I got it. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, safe way to tell an adult. Um, so, you know, we, I want kids to know that we will walk our talk and talk our walk, and we expect them to do the same. I, li- I like that a lot, though. Walk our walk and talk our walk. Our, talk. Walk our walk talk our and talk walk. our walk. Yeah, yep, you got it. <laughs> okay, good. Whew, that was tough. That's actually going to be the name of the episode. So if I can figure it out, I got to be able to do that to, to, to market <laughs> walk, the episode. Talk, talk the walk. <laughs> there you go. I love it. Let me ask you this real quick. Uh, I know we're coming short on time and you're about to catch a flight. Uh, you you named the not-so-innocent bystander in your book. Yes. And, I mean, the, the bully, obvious who that is. The bullied, obvious who that is. But help me understand how a bystander that sees this and it becomes not so innocent is it because they don't okay. do anything or how? I'll, I'll give you those roles again. Yeah. And by the way, the bully's not always so apparent. There are three roles bullies can play. They can be the instigator, the planner or the perpetrator or all three. You could have a young girl who instigates other girls spreading a rumor. And so those henchmen go and spread that rumor. They get in trouble, and she's going, I didn't do it. Didn't do it. Wasn't me. Right, right. You can have a planner who says, you know, I'm a small boy, and I want to get that other small boy. But we're fairly equally matched, so I'm going to get my henchmen to go after him. They beat him up. They always get suspended, and he said, wasn't me. So there are a variety of roles there. Uh, You can't tell a bully by how he or she looks. It's how they act. Um, 
that right below them is the bully's henchman who puts her backpack down so that the other little girl can't sit down. Um, the active supporter is a girl who whips out her cell phone, videos it, and puts it up on YouTube for everybody to laugh at. And she said, but I didn't bully. No, but you're part of the problem. The passive supporter is the girl who downloads that video and sits there and laughs about it. And she said, but I didn't do anything. Yeah, but you're getting pleasure from another kid's pain. You're part of the problem. The very bottom group is a deadly lot, which can include us as adults. And that's the disengaged onlooker who turns a blind eye. So it's just part of growing up. It's what boys do. It's what girls do. You know, get over it. Or the girl or boy who says, well, it's not my problem. They're not my age. You know, I'm not stepping into this. On the upswing, the potential witness, the kid you did raise to act with integrity and civility and compassion, but she's afraid. And so she gets a headache because she goes along and doesn't feel so good about it. How do you get rid of your headache? Start to blame the target. Well, she is weird. She is dorky. Who wants her around? And then your headache's gone. <laughs> Uh, again, at the very top is that young person who says, I feel awful that that's happening and right. I've got to do something. And there's the three roles, just like the bully has three roles. Gotcha. Witness, go and report it to somebody. Defender uh, and uh, a resistor. Gotcha. So we want, I want to raise that third group. And we've seen some beautiful examples of that. Um, in our history and most recently. And I want young people to understand uh, that we're there for them as well to break this cycle. No more, not here, never. This is safe harbor wherever I'm at, whether I'm on a bus or a street corner or in a classroom. This is safe harbor for every kid that walks through that door. Sure. You listed in your, your pamphlet or your PDF that you sent me a variety of different types of bullying what do you feel was the most prevalent form of bullying today? I'm going to guess that it's the cyberbullying, but maybe I'm wrong. And you're close. Okay. It's online, offline have merged. Okay. And it, it has become our young people's real world. So rarely is somebody simply targeted online, which is horrible in itself. Um, I help the Texas um, – Develop the David's Law on cyberbullying uh, and making it um, uh, certain forms of that when you tell somebody to kill themselves, a criminal offense. Right, right. Um, and I'm, I'm that passed their legislature. And it, because David had killed himself, and after his death, his parents found all this online stuff, and the San Antonio Press actually published all this ugly things that people had said to him. So, but it doesn't just stop there. That's why I say, you know, it used to be online and the real world. Now, the real world is our online, offline world that our kids face. So they can target somebody online, verbally, uh, or with pictures, or locking them out of chat rooms, and then when they go to school, wait to see what kind of reaction the kid gets. Is he walking in sulking? Is he sad? Is he scared? Oh, yay, we, we succeeded. So it's the merger of the two that is the most volatile for our young people today. Um, there are four ways and three means we can bully. One, and I fought since 2001 to get laws in different states and throughout the world to change. It used to say that bullying must be continuous and repeated over time. Don't you think once in the toilet counts? One, your shoe, once your shoe thrown over the fence matters. Once called a gross sexual term matters. Once ostracized matters. So many states now have gone to it can be a one-time significant event. Wow. And we don't wait for it to happen twice before we count it as mean and cruel and bullying. The second is the most common, continuous and repeated over time. The third we've seen in the headlines lately, hazing, deadly hazing, ritualized initiation intended to denigrate and humiliate in order for a child to get in a group. Um, it in It's not some hazing is mean, some hazing is bullying, all hazing by its nature is mean and cruel. And then the fourth is the one you mentioned, cyber or digital or technology enhanced bullying. All four of those can be done three ways, verbal, physical, and re relational or social. Young people use the term social. My generation calls it relational. But it's all four of those can be done those three ways. And it's understanding that that's what that is. For instance, the difference between teasing and taunting. 
Teasing is laughing with your friend. Taunting is laughing at your target. Huge difference. I actually have a joke about that that I will say to coworkers playfully, but maybe I'm making, I'm justifying my bullying possibly by going, no, I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing with you, but really they know I'm laughing at them. And only in, here I go, I'm feeling guilty. But it, You it, should. It, you had good or bad. Because you seem like a humorous man anyway, so use that to get everybody to laugh with us. Because you know what? Uh, teasing is critical. It helps cement relationships, whether it's in the workplace or in a re romantic relationship or a relationship with your child, to use humor. Taunting, which is a form of bullying, right. severs relationships. Definitely. It's intended to hurt. Now, does that mean that you can't joke and it's the wrong time, wrong place, didn't quite come out right? What do you do when the other person's face drops and you get they get sad? You stop oh, right away. Yes, ma'am. What bullies do? Keep it up. See, and that's why I always marvel that in some anti-bullying programs, it says, just tell the bully, uh, please stop. That hurts. Oh, good. That'll work, right? No. That's what you say to a friend who didn't realize how you were feeling that day, and it was the wrong time, wrong place, or it just came out wrong, you know? Right. So, Let's use a lot of humor in our lives, and it just came out wrong. But as soon as their face dropped, they got sad, you would quit. And that's the difference between teasing and taunting. Laughing with, laughing at. If it's laughing with and you blew it, you fix it right away. If it's laughing at, you keep going. That's exactly right. And that's that's exactly what I do. Not I'm not saying this to try to justify what I just said. That really is exactly what I do. I've always been empathetic to a person's feelings. But at the same time, I would tell you right now, my best friend right now and has been, I've known him for nearly 20 years now, we don't feel like we're on the same page unless we're calling each other names. It won't well, even... but you see, if you're laughing with, right. and then you have to say to one another, uh, we, we have really good times together. <laughs> and, and maybe we don't need this part of our relationship. Right, right, right. You know, it's always possible for us all to grow. Um, because you're laughing. It's, it's a way you communicate. And, and it can be, I'm, I'm not going to judge it. I, I mean, it can be something that's real important for the two of you. And again, guys and gals do it a little bit differently. Um, and it's your body posture, your tone of voice. I mean, we speak five ways. Our bodies, our face, our eyes, our tone of voice, and what we actually say. Right. It's like that little third grade boy. We had a teacher who didn't like him and, and didn't like third grade boys. And the kid nailed her on it and said, you don't like third grade boys. She said, that's not true. I like third grade boys. Kid looked back up and said, would you tell your face that then? You see, it's it's if you're you know if you have a strong relationship with somebody, you can joke in a way that others on the outside may not look at or, or look askance at you, but you know that you don't cross limits that right. would be hurtful or harmful. And you see, if we can teach kindergarten through fourth grade boys and girls the difference between teasing and taunting, then we have laid a very critical foundation to teach kids the difference between flirting, which is normal, natural, and necessary and helps keep the human race going, and sexual bullying, which is in the news today. Right. And, and sexual bullying, part of that can be a verbal uh, taunting using sexual terms and innuendos. So if we can build that foundation very young, then by fourth grade, we can open up about those kinds of things with young people. Well, and that's kind of where I was going with that was that uh, although he and I have that relationship, we used to work together and he left to do his own thing. And a, a, I was looking to supplement that that banter, right? So uh, yeah. we had some new guys show up and they seemed like they could probably take it, right? So I started off real light and even the light uh, poking and prodding or teasing was, <clears throat> excuse me, was unacceptable. They did not know how to take it. They did not know how to deal with it. And you picked that up? Did you pick it up oh, before yeah. I have to tell you? No, no, no. I picked it up 100%. Yeah. And but, it, because you have a bond with this other human being. Right. Exactly. That's why spouses can tease one another and others might look and go, oh, my goodness. <laughs> right. Or they can make one word or a facial expression and they both get it. Exactly. And my you wife know? and I are that way. And people go, what? How does that? What? But anyway, yeah. so, uh, th th yeah, that was my point was that, you know, just because you have this type of relationship with someone where you can do that, it doesn't automatically stretch it to everyone. No one no. is going to get that you're just playing. 
just because you're and playing. You also have to, uh, when I lecture, I say to people, were any of you, and these are adults who are successful human beings sure. in their professions, have any of you ever been taunted in the your younger years and now you don't even like teasing? And many people raise their hand and say, I don't like it. I have to tell my husband I don't want anyone teasing me because everyone told me when I was younger that they were teasing me, not taunting me. And now I don't trust any teasing. And right. that's that's fair. And that means you've got to tell your spouse or your partners or your people you work with, you know, I don't handle that well. Right. We all need to be able to share that with one another and what we don't handle well. Some people don't handle uh, certain smells of food well. You know? Right. Don't it's make being liver. Open with one another and being honest with one another. That matters. You know, a death camp survivor was asked. How do we begin to break this cycle of violence? And he said, we must do three things. Pay attention to what's going on around us. Get involved and never, ever look away. And I think that's across the board in human relationships. And I think that's a perfect ending for our conversation. So, well, thank you. I hope to have another one with you. Man, I would. Lo- I consider to talk to you for hours, literally. I mean, a thirty. Well, and I will miss my plane. <laughs> I, I, I know, so I don't want that to happen, Barbara. I want to thank you very much. It, do, you, do, you, do you want to give your social media connections uh, here? Or sure. Okay. It, it's uh, www.kidsareworthit all spelled out. Dot uh, at Gmail. Oh uh, no, I'm giving you my Gmail. <laughs> uh, at, start that over. www kidsareworthit.com and then info.kidsareworthit at gmail.com Perfect, perfect, perfect. I'll make sure to include that in the show notes uh, as well as the publishing that I do for the show. This episode is actually going to drop Monday morning. Oh, great. Uh, It will be coming down the pipe really, really quick and we look forward to uh, getting some responses back from our listeners seeing what sort of feedback. And you're welcome to post the little handout there uh, because there are things on teasing and taunting and what to do if your kid's been targeted, what not to do. I made some of those mistakes myself. And how can you tell if a kid's been targeted and what to do if you happen to have a bully in the house? Yeah, we have one of those. (laughs) (laughs) Barbara, take care of yourself. I appreciate it once again. Thank you, Larry. It's been a real pleasure. Good luck on your flight. Have a great flight home. Thank you. All righty, bye-bye. You could be larger than life